You ever seen a ghost? Been abducted? Heard your name whispered from the other room when you're all alone? No, you say? Me either. But if you're like me, you're still fascinated by the paranormal. It seems everyone else has had an experience, and you want to believe it all. So why doesn't it happen to us? What does it all mean? How does it work? Is any of it real? Welcome to Paranorm Girl, a show that will attempt to answer these questions by taking the paranormal completely apart in search of proof. I'm not a blind believer, nor a hardened skeptic. I'm just looking for answers and willing to accept what I find. Welcome back to the Paranorm Girl podcast. I am your host, Kristen. On today's conversation episode, I speak with author and paranormal researcher Keith Evans. Keith has written a book called The Hayes House, Ghosts Are People Too, wherein he relays his incredibly in-depth look at the history of the location and its inhabitants, in addition to the play-by-play of his recorded investigations of the property that took place over the course of about 41 hours. With a background in science, Keith's approach to the paranormal may be analytical, but thanks to his personal experiences since the age of four, he approaches it with positivity, kindness, and a deep desire to understand it, because ghosts are people too. Enjoy the show. Keith Evans is a paranormal researcher and author who has written a book called The Hayes House, Ghosts Are People Too, which we're going to discuss a little bit here before we get into some of his other areas of interest. Keith, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Oh, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on. So I want to get right into it. So your book, The Hayes House, Ghosts Are People Too, I, I don't think I've ever read a, um, a paranormal-based book quite like this, and, and we can talk about that and how you chose that sort of information that you included in it in just a moment, but maybe let's start here. Um, the first question that I had going through it was, why the Hayes House specifically? What drew you to that location and ultimately brought about the book? Well, I had completed paranormal research uh, starting in about... 2012 at different locations uh, in Apalachicola. And some of those locations, um, the first two families that lived at the Hayes House had worked at the locations where I had completed paranormal research. So I was receiving good uh, paranormal activity at the location where the first two families who had lived at the Hayes House had actually worked within the community or the little town of Apalachicola, Florida. So I figured if I could get permission to do paranormal research at the uh, old 1908 Victorian uh, home, I, I figured I would get good paranormal activity there. So that's what made me decide to uh, choose that location. Okay. Okay. So you talked about getting this paranormal activity at these other locations and did did I hear did I hear you right you said that the same um, energies or spirits that you believe would be part of the Hayes house that were at these other locations yes because it was uh, uh, one or two of the locations were places that uh, family members of uh, the first two families that lived at the Hayes house had either worked and uh, or lived okay okay well at what point did you did you confirm for yourself, like, like when did you know that the Hayes house itself had those spirits still around? Well, it wasn't until I got the written permission uh, to go there and do paranormal activity for a book. And once I had that and actually started to do paranormal research, that pretty much confirmed it. I pretty much uh, confirmed that the uh, first family that lived in the Hayes house, uh, Jeff Beck was the father and the gentleman that built the Hayes house. And his oldest son also uh, was there. And his youngest daughter, Emmeline. I actually got uh, Emmeline's name uh, in the smallest bedroom on the second floor. And there's only one small bedroom because it's right across. Um, they made like a whole big room, the bathroom, <laughs> when they built the house, apparently. So Emmeline's room was the smallest room, 
And I considered that because she was like uh, the youngest of, uh, I think he had four or five children. I'm glad you you started going into the information because what I mentioned there at, at the start of the show uh, was the difference that sets this book apart from other paranormal-based publications. The most notable differences are in the sheer amount of the history and the detail that you get into, not just for the Hayes family, the Bucks, but the actual rooms and areas on the property. Um, you also include your your Ovilus 4 sessions with time stamps of each room with EMF readings, temperature readings, and then you include like a, a final analysis of evidence uh, and these sessions. In a sense, this is taking on like an incredibly uh, analytical format. It's very scientific report format. I'm I'm interested to know what was the reason behind presenting and including the information in this way. Well, I wanted to bring the reader into the paranormal session like they were actually there. Each chapter is like, uh, except for the first chapter, the first chapter covers the family, the Buck family. And I really didn't know how they utilized the uh, Hayes house. Uh, Like I understood how the Hayes family, like where Pat and Kathleen's bedroom was, where Annie and Sunshine's bedroom was. I didn't really understand how the Buck family used the house, so I just made a uh, first chapter of the history of the Buck family, which I, I don't have a whole lot of history on the Buck family. Then, starting with the second chapter through the 21st chapter, it's either one room or one of the three porches. And it's a whole chapter. I start out, for instance, like if I'm talking about the dining room, I'll start out with a history of the dining room, like how the uh, Hayes family used the dining room for Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner, uh, what their uh, menu was, and uh, what family members showed up for uh, Christmas and Thanksgiving dinner. And then I'll go into actually doing at least two, some rooms I did three, but at least two one hour long paranormal sessions where I give like a transcript of what actually happens, you know, a blow by blow transcript. While I was doing the paranormal session, I actually took like shorthand notes of what was happening because sometimes, you know, you might get a uh, millimeter spike and you might get a, uh, you know, words on the obvious side, but at the same time, my car alarm might go off, which is parked in front of the Hayes house, and then dogs might start barking. And then, you you know, I want to write all this down and let people know that there's a lot going on that just kind of is totally distracting while you're doing paranormal research, besides what's happening with your equipment. So I put in a lot of detail about what happens during paranormal research, because sometimes nothing happens at all. But when something does happen, it seems like there's enough energy that, you know, it'll cause the millimeter to have a spike. It'll cause a word uh, to be chosen by the obelisk. At that time, I was using the obelisk four. And at the same time, my car alarm will go off and the dogs in the neighborhood start barking. So, I wanted people to get a feel of what I was actually feeling when I was doing the paranormal research. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to say I, I appreciated that transparency that you include in that. The fact that you, any paranormal investigator <laughs> will know um, it's not always, you know, catching that world shattering evidence. It's not always that. Um, and sometimes you are catching, you know, um, nothing at all and sometimes it's the car alarm and and so you spoke to that you know it's the dogs barking you spoke to that so I just really appreciate that transparency how much time total would you say you have spent investigating this specific location gosh um at least well before the book I would just count the time before the book was published because I did spend some time there after the book was published and believe me, when I was living there after the book was published, the paranormal was a lot better. 
but you're there 24-7. But before the book was published, I was only there, uh, I did at least two one-hour paranormal sessions of each of 20 locations. I think 17 were rooms and three were porches. There's a porch on the second floor and then a wraparound porch on the first floor in the front of the house and a small porch in the back of the house, <clears throat> which used to extend all the way across the house, but it got built in as part of the <clears throat> first floor bathroom and part of the kitchen pantry. So anyway, I at least spent 20 times two, at least 40 hours. And I know for the den, I did three hours. So at least 41 hours of actual paranormal sessions where the equipment was all set up. I'd already done my background checks with the metal meter to make sure that I wasn't picking up anything that was, say, electrical box, you know, that was on the other side of a wall. I wanted to make sure if there was any electrical appliances, I knew uh, what they, you know, their background readings were and to stay away from them. So I would say 41 hours altogether. So it was a relatively small amount of time, but it was stretched out over, uh, I started in November of 2016 and I would do a couple hours each week and then I, I actually had kidney failure and I was in the hospital for 45 days and I didn't start back up doing the paranormal research until I think it was like April or May of 2017 and uh, the book was published August of 2018 and I would I would still go back and refine things because uh, the the owner that gave me permission owned the place until about March of 2019. So prior to publishing the book, even though I had completed uh, most of my paranormal research probably before the end of 2017, I still went back and uh, would check on things. Say if I wasn't sure or I missed a picture of a certain room or, you know, wanted to know what was actually there, I would go back and check. And the owner allowed me uh, a certain period of time to go back and clarify certain things. But I don't think I'd done any paranormal research in 2018. But my memory's not that good. The book is laying right here, but I won't fumble through it. But it's done in chronological order. So what uh, chapter two would be the earliest, you know, the first time that I did paranormal research. And then chapter 21 would be the actual last chronological paranormal research that I did at the Hayes house. Wow. So 41 hours total of, of just sheer investigating. Yes. And, and I really feel ghosts are people too. It's just our soul after we pass away you know, that's what we become. We become a spirit, which is a, a, a small packet of elect electromagnetic energy. And I really feel that ghosts and spirits won't warm up to you until they've been around you a while. Some may. Some ghosts or spirits might be outgoing. It's like you might, uh, you know, go down the street the first time somebody meets you. They might tell you their life story. You know, they might feel comfortable enough with you to do that. But most ghosts and spirits are very personal. Like, even my own father didn't want to tell me how bad his health was. So some people are that particular. Like, some people won't even tell you that they bought a third house because they don't want you to know how much money they have. So ghosts and spirits are the same way. They, they're very, whatever your personality is when you pass away, you're that protected about your personal information even after you pass away. So asking a person how they died, they might think, well, that's none of your business, you know, because when a person dies, it's a very vulnerable time. You know, it's like, you know, if you fell into quicksand and someone say, how does this feel almost die? You know, you're like, well, you don't want to answer that question. You want them to go away or rescue you. And I think ghosts and spirits are the same way. When you start asking them personal questions, I think it turns them off. I think if anything, you have to go into paranormal research 
knowing a bit about the ghost or spirits that might actually come back as a guardian angel and want to look after the house. And you got to talk about something they're interested in. Like, for instance, Pat and Kathleen like to play cards. And um, Kathleen played bridge. And even though some people said bridge was supposed to be a game for females, I think males play bridge too. So I think both Pat and Kathleen play bridge. And if you talked about that, they're going to respond to you because that's something that they enjoyed doing when they were alive. So you have to make sure that when you go into a paranormal situation, you talk about something that the ghost or spirit can relate to, uh, something that the ghost or spirit is passionate about. Say if you went into a house where a man collected old cars, you know, I asked him, so, well, my favorite old car is a 1937, you know, Ford, you know, that's going to spark the interest of the ghost spirit. Just to go into a place and say, are you here? You know, it, it's best to go into a place and actually ask specific questions. Like, for instance, when I asked Pat, I think I was in the dining room at the time. I said, Pat, what did you think about the Great Depression? If I remember correctly, his word was anger that he chose through the Obelisk Four. And I think he chose anger because he owned a lot of property and property values went down. And only logic would tell you if you had borrowed money against your property and your property is no longer worth the value of that money, you know, you might be in trouble with the bank or have to pay your loan off. So I try to ask more personal questions. And another thing I wanted to cover before we go too far I have people who always say, well, your paranormal, uh, your paranormal research gets boring. And uh, especially when I was on Facebook and they'd say, how come you're not like the ones on TV where they're always getting good paranormal? The situation is <clears throat> when you watch a football game, you might watch three quarters and no one scores a, a touchdown. And then in the fourth quarter, <clears throat> there might be, a lot of, you know, turnovers, a lot of points scored. When you watch a TV program, you're only seeing the highlights of the paranormal research that takes place. When I did the Hayes House Ghoster people, too, <clears throat> I didn't put in the highlights. I put in a transcript of everything that happens so that anyone out there who says, well, I'd like to do paranormal research, they're not going to get disappointed when they don't go in in one hour and, you know, see the refrigerator turn across the, uh, you know, floor or see a spoon get up and dance. And if I see anything visual ever since I've been doing paranormal research, and I started when I was about four years old uh, to notice the paranormal and notice there was something else going on that other members in my family didn't see, I have never seen a lot of physical things happening with objects. Uh, that's just something that most ghosts of spirits don't have the energy to do that. It just doesn't happen. It may happen, but it's very few and far between. Most objects that move, you better have a well-lit room. You better have cameras pointing in all four directions so you can catch the settled motion that a ghost or spirit will make. Otherwise, you're going to miss it. I was doing one paranormal research uh, where and there was an ashtray. I, I was looking at the table, and I actually saw it just move a little bit, maybe a 15-degree turn. You know, not much of a turn, but it turned. And I thought that was so cool. And the place I was at, I could never get per written permission, so I can't use the name. Uh, but the ghost or spirit that was there was so cool towards me. The ghost or spirit, I'll just say it was a, fee uh, a male, he would, like, knock near the fireplace. And I would say, okay, I hear you knocking near the fireplace. And then he would knock uh, on the floor between the fireplace and the bed. And I'd say, okay, I can hear you knocking on the floor. And then at the foot of the bed, there was like a little place to sit down, had a, like a cushion on it. 
But what it was, it had a lid, and you could put blankets in there. I don't know. People used to call them cedar chesses, but I don't know if this was a more modern chess. But I could actually hear someone sit down because I had sat down on it. I didn't see any movement to the cushion, but I could hear someone sit down. And I said, I can hear you sitting down on the cushion in front of the bed. From where I was sitting, I was sitting like across from the uh, cushion of this chest that was uh, in front of the bed. And straight line of view was that ashtray. And then I saw the ashtray move. And even after the paranormal session, I, that ashtray will not move on its own. I tried to get it, get it to swivel, and it looked to be a, a very level area of the floor. So it wasn't something that was not level, which caused the ashtray to move. And, of course, when the ashtray moved, I told the gentleman that I saw you move the ashtray. And that type of contact is, you know, you're not getting any words. You're not finding out anything about their life. But they're they're attempting to move closer to you without scaring you. Yeah. And when they find you're not scared, they'll do more. But I think ghosts and spirits are just like people. If I was walking down the street and everyone said, oh, my God, it's Keith Evans, run. And everyone took off, start running. You know, I wouldn't want to communicate with them or be their friend. And when you get scared, when paranormal activity is taking place, I think you're doing more to just scare the ghost off or not, or cause the ghost not to want to communicate with you. Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't if, if I were on the receiving end of that. I, of course not. Well, I want to I wanna speak to a couple of things that, that you mentioned. Um, one, you got to imagine the sheer amount of energy it takes for a ghost or a spirit to manifest in order to physically move something that is not even on their on their level they're not physical anymore to physically move something so it's incredibly rare it's a lot rarer than than we see on these uh television shows and the videos um, so I'm glad, you know, you, you look to debunk these things um, and uh, and try try to find a logical reason. But um, I think it is incredibly rare. And then for people who are who are the ones that are saying, you know, why can't this be as exciting, you know, as, as what I'm seeing on television? They're always getting great stuff. I mean, nowadays, especially, and it's been going this way, it's the trend, but people's attention spans are so short they are so short and they're getting shorter by the day it reminded me of a quote i heard once um nobody nobody wants to hear about the birth they just want to see the baby because you go into so so much detail about these you know investigations that somebody who's never paranormally investigated before can read through your transcripts and see every single step every single thing that goes into it and feel like they've been there like like they did that you know um so i don't know just made me think of that well i just have one more question uh, about the hayes house here and then we can kind of move on um I, I was just curious out of all of that investigating that you conducted there can you recall the most incredible piece of evidence that you collected? Well, there's probably more than, than one, but um, I would say the one that stands out was, at the time, I didn't know it was Pat and Kathleen's room, bedroom on the first floor. I was under the assumption a big house like that, uh, all the bedrooms would be on the second floor. So, and I had not found out yet from the family all the history about the house. I kind of found out the history as I went because as soon as I got permission to do the uh, book, the owner had put the house up for sale. And I thought, oh my, if I don't get to do paranormal research in each room and each porch of the house, how am I going to do the book? It'll be incomplete. So I started the paranormal research before I had a real good basis of history and understanding about how the Hayes family used the house. So I had no idea I was in the actual bedroom of Pat and Kathleen. So when I started using my thermal imager, I was stunned by the fact that there was like a cold, uh, thin pipe-like area on the northeast corner of the room. 
and I thought, wow, that that dark blue thermal image is, is almost like closer to black, dark blue, and it's running right in the corner of the room. That I've never seen that before. So I quickly turned around to check the southwest corner of the room to see if it was the same. And when I did, I saw three, it went from like three to two undulating silhouettes. I don't know if if anyone remembers the pop-up targets in the Army where you had like a, a body, a shoulder, and a head, and you would shoot at those to qualify. That's what I was looking at. I was looking at, and it would kind of undulate from two to three silhouettes. And I thought, I'd never seen that before. I didn't have to look away from my screen and my thermal imager, which uh, I'll let everyone, if they're not familiar with thermal imagers, it doesn't show you the object. It shows you the temperature of the object, which is color-coded. So if all the objects in the room were the same color and they were, say, very cold, you would see either black, blue would be warmer, next would be purple, uh, next would be red, uh, next would be orange, next would be yellow, and white is like very, very hot. So what I was seeing was a combination between black and blue, which is very cold. Now, the rest of the room uh, was pretty much room temperature around 60, and that will show up as like a uh, anywhere from purple to, you know, yeah, um uh, orange, it'll be that type of color. It won't be very hot or it won't be very cold, meaning yellow and white is going to be very hot. And then uh, your cooler colors are black and blue, and that's anything that's like 40 degrees and lower in temperature. So I felt that the long black or blue cold object that was like a pipe in the corner of the northeast side of the room, I think that was Pat Hayes. He was the owner who purchased the house in 1942. And I think when I turned to the other corner, which was uh, this undulating silhouette that went from like three to two, weren't actually on the corner. They were, they were like somewhere between facing the corner and where I was standing. And I think that was Kathleen, Pat's wife, his mother, Annie, who would come down from Tallahassee and spend the weekends many, many of the times at Pat's house. And also his aunt, which was Annie's sister, and that was Sunshine Gibson. And she actually lived at the Hayes house from 1942 when Pat and Kathleen bought the Hayes house. And then she passed away in 1956. So... I think that's who I was seeing. And my mind was in overload. I'm trying to think. This happened after I had had kidney failure. So I was already at a uh, a weakened state, more or less. Uh, I don't know if anyone has ever had kidney failure before, but it really hit me hard. And I was weak, but I wanted to continue paranormal research because I wanted to get the book done before the Hayes house was sold. So I was in, you know, I tell people not to be frightened of the paranormal, but it will set you back when it happens to you. And even a seasoned veteran like me, I've never had such overwhelming cold areas like that in my life. Now, Pat was very tall. He was about six foot three, and he was very thin. He had a uh, a waist of about, 28 until he was like in his 50s. So he was a very thin person. And I think he appeared to me as a very narrow pipe, which to me, when you look through the screen of the thermal imager, which is a screen no bigger than maybe two inches by two inches, but you point it towards the corner and then you see this long, narrow pipe looking black or blue cold area. I think that was Pat, and in the other corner, it was Kathleen, uh, Annie, and Sunshine. And I think what they were doing, they were coming to greet me the way 
someone would greet you if you went to their house at Christmas time. Whoever arrives, everyone greets them. But I took it as, well, maybe they don't want me to be doing a book about their house. And believe it or not, when I left the Hayes house that day, I wasn't living there at that time. I didn't have a chance to live at the Hayes house until after I wrote the book, which was after Hurricane Michael. But when I left there that day, believe it or not, I forgot all about that situation until I was reading the uh, transcript that I had written down for that hour-long session, and then it came back to me. And it was almost like they helped me to forget that because it allowed me to think, well, maybe if they don't want me to write the book, then maybe I should just not write the book. And I don't think they wanted me to feel that way. So if you do have a, a paranormal experience, which is, I hate to use the word overwhelming, but intense compared to what most paranormal experiences are, you might have a tendency, no matter how seasoned veteran you are with dealing with paranormal, you might have a tendency to wonder, is, is it negative or positive? And it's almost like they helped me to forget about it, so I would continue on with the, you know, doing my paranormal research like nothing happened. And that was the strangest part about that whole situation. Uh, it was spectacular that I got that many cold areas in a short period of time within an hour span, but it was also spectacular that I forgot about it because I wasn't sure whether it was a positive or negative experience. So by forgetting about it, I went on like nothing happened. And that was spectacular. It was almost like the ghost of spirit said, oh, he might stop the book because he's not sure whether this was positive or negative. And, you know, it was almost like they helped me to forget about it. But when I found out that that was Pat and Kathleen's room, it kind of, you know, put two and two together. That's where they were going to meet me and say, hey, we're, we're happy you're here. We're happy you're working on the book. And we're going to materialize and greet you. And I think that was the best they could do with the energy that they had. I don't think all ghosts of spirits can materialize as a, a, a living person. Now, I have had situations in my life where I have seen people who would look as real as I am right now, and then I'd never see them again. And they'd always say something nice or something profoundly great, or they knew something about me. And I thought, well, how could you know that? I don't know you. I've never seen you before. I wouldn't say that, but I'd be thinking that. So I have seen people that look very real who I think were actually ghosts or spirits because you never see them again. And uh, I've actually had that happen to me where other people were around. And he, after the fact, the other people said, no, we did not see anyone. There was no one sitting in that chair. So anyway, some people might say, well, you're delusional. You're seeing things. But most of the time when people are delusional, they see things that aren't positive or helpful to their life. And when I see things that uh, looks like a, a actual person, uh, they usually say something profoundly nice, like they're encouraging me and, you know, cheering me on. And you don't get that. Today's age, most people will be quiet or they will criticize you. So to have someone you've never seen before come up and say, you will go on to do great things. It's like, who talks like that in today's you know world? But it's nice to hear it. And it's nice that someone will say something like that. But then when you can't find that person and you never see them again, you know, it makes you wonder, were they actually a living person or were they a ghost of spirit? that appeared to somehow they tap into your brain so that electronically they can manipulate your brain so that you can see them so that they look real. And I, I think that I think that's spectacular. And I think if, had I not been a paranormal researcher or trying to figure out the paranormal since I was four years old where my parents said, oh, you're just being a kid. You're being silly. And I said, no, there's something 
something going on here that can't be explained by the way you, you know, my parents are explaining life. You know, so I think more ghosts of spirits are willing to show themselves if they can because I accept that they are there. It would be like if I wanted to go play football and the coach and the other players said, oh, you're not a football player, get off the field. And by not acknowledging that the ghosts of spirits are there, that's kind of like what we're doing. We're shunning them. We're, you know, not giving them the time of day, almost like they've been, oh, gosh, what's one of the religious terms for when you kind of like shun a person? I can't think of the term for it right now. But I know the Catholic religion calls it excommunication, where you're not supposed to communicate with a person anymore. And, you know, that's kind of like what most people are doing with ghosts and spirits by not acknowledging that they are there. And I think that's hurtful. And I, I think ghosts and spirits have feelings just like we have. They might not be able to uh, talk the way we talk or pick up an object and move it around the way we do or manipulate the physical world the way we do because they are just electromagnetic energy. But I still think they have thoughts and feelings and passions, and I think they can get their feelings hurt. And at the same time, if you show them respect, they can honor that and want to communicate with you more. Yeah, well, you know, most people, they don't get to see that, you know, with with their eyes. They don't get to experience the paranormal at the level that, you know, you have. Um, and, And for the most part, people are going to be afraid of the mystery of what they do not understand. I mean, you're obviously, since you've been experiencing things, these things since you were four, um, you're, you're sensitive, you're more sensitive to these things, and you are accepting of it. Hello, my name is Jordan Klein, and I am the host of Fireside Paranormal Podcast. If you're into ghosts, UFOs, cryptids, the unknown, then pull up a chair and join me by the fire as we hear real stories from real people. Each episode, I interview paranormal investigators, authors, experts and legends in their field here at fireside paranormal podcast we have something for everyone if you're an experienced researcher or if you're just getting into it we have a spot for you we're found anywhere you listen to podcasts so grab your friends tune in and remember don't be afraid only believe now you are uh very active on your youtube account Uh, with your short sessions, uh, with your other investigating. I wanted to ask you about these other locations that you visited and, like, what kind of evidence and, uh, you know, how how have those sessions been like for you? Like, I'm I'm speaking to the, I saw you went to the Chestnut Street Cemetery. You were at an old steam engine, those kinds of things. How did those go for you? Well, I try to do different places uh, that are just out in the public eye without the, Try to go there when no one else is around because I I find you always get more paranormal activity if there's not other people around. It's almost like ghost spirits want to communicate one-on-one and not with a crowd because most people aren't good speaking or addressing a crowd. I think ghost spirits are the same way. Uh, I get paranormal activity. Usually uh, in the past, I've used the Obelisk 5B a lot. My Obelisk 4 washed away during the storm surge of uh, Hurricane Michael in October of uh, 2018. So after that, I purchased a uh, Obelisk 5. So paranormal short sessions, I think, were all pretty much during the era of having the Obelisk 5. And uh, that that's the best paranormal tool I use to get information. At the steam engine number 11, which is in... Uh, Um, Port St. Joe, Florida, there's a lot of paranormal activity in that area. That building has been there, gosh, I think it was built in 1921. And apparently that there was a building there before that where Florida had a, a constitutional convention where they were just a territory and where they were accepted into of the United States as a state. And I think that was 1821. Anyway, the paranormal research uh, activity is good there. I try to ask 
about the train and anyone who worked on the train. And I'm kind of disappointed that I haven't really got a lot of clear answers about anyone who actually worked on the train or try to find more out about the history. But I think the fact that the old train is there, it is almost like a beacon to draw people who have passed away, who remember the train, who that was a big part of their life. Because a lot of people, that was the main way to travel. From the time steam engines were developed uh, up until they were no longer being used right before World War II, you know, that was the main mode that most people traveled. So they, if, they, if a ghost of spirit's going to come back, they're going to come back to visit something that they loved and cherished when they were alive. Just like uh, at the Hayes house, you had the three members of the Buck family, and you have, um, you know, at least five or six members of the Hayes family, to include a lifelong friend, Mary, who actually lived in the same room, uh, her bedroom was the same room as Jeff Buck's youngest daughter, Emily. So when you have that type of love that these ghosts had for the house or for the train, they're going to come back to the places that they loved when they were alive. And by keeping the old houses like the Hayes house and keeping it original, Ghost of Spirits are going to keep that bond. You know, if you change the old train or the Hayes house too much, that could break that bond and there will be less paranormal activity. Okay. And I saw um, in a few of your more recent videos, you used something called the Envoy. What's what's your overall opinion on that? Well, the Envoy requires a ghost of spirit to choose individual Letters and you can slow the speed of the envoy down, but ghosts of spirits, if they're choosing a letter to make up a word, there's only like 11 characters that you actually see, and it goes from like uh, left to right, and then it'll start over once it fills up all 11 characters. There's no spaces, so you'll just get 11 characters, then it'll go back, and then it'll start over, and that first uh, character will be displaced, and then it has like a little box around the next character that's going to be displaced. So I find that most ghost spirits may not have enough energy to complete a word, say even if if it's a four-letter word. And at the same time, it's kind of innovative that it, it gives you certain sensitivities that you can either turn down or turn up. For instance, like the ghost can utilize Kathy to choose a letter. And you can turn that sensitivity up to the point where all you'll get is constant letters being chosen that don't make up a word. And a lot of them happen to be towards the end of the alphabet, and most of them are constants, not vowels. So I find that you can't turn the sensitivity up too high or you'll just get random words. It doesn't seem to make any sense. <clears throat> and it also has a sensitivity for temperature, where the ghost spirit can somehow use change of temperature to choose a word. And then they have electromagnetic energy. And since ghost spirits are electromagnetic energy, it seems like tapping might just be a form of them getting close to it. So they might actually be the same thing if you look at it from a physics type uh, look at how the ghost of spirit would actually manipulate the envoy. You know, if they're going to tap it, that means they have to move their electromagnetic energy in and out. But if that's all a ghost of spirit is, then the electromagnetic energy sensitivity would actually be the same as tapping. So I don't know if the ghost stop who makes the envoy has, has thought that out all the way. And maybe I'm overthinking it, but that's the way I look at it. I find that it's not as reliable as the Oculus 5. And I think one reason is that the ghost spirits run out of energy before they can choose a word. And also the fact that it's got a moving selection going from A to Z. Suppose the ghost spirit's not fast enough 
and say they want to spell uh, hello, and, you know, it's H-I. They miss H and they hit I, and then they want to spell uh, E in hello, and they, they choose D before, you know, A, B, C, D. They hit it too soon and choose D instead of E. Then you have ID, and, you know, you think, well, they want to know my ID or, you know, my driver's license. It could be very difficult for a ghost spirit to learn how to use a new piece of equipment. The Obelus 5 and the Obelus 4, similar technology, which is copyrighted, and I'm, I'm not privy to know how that works. Obelus has been out since, you know, maybe 10 years ago. So ghost of spirits have probably learned how to manipulate most obelisks. But it might be 10 years down the line before you have a ghost or a spirit in your environment that is well-versed on how to use the envoy. And by then, they might be able to quickly manipulate it to choose letters. And maybe by slowing it down, maybe that is a mistake on my part. Maybe I should actually speed it up because maybe they're very good at selecting it when it's going fast. And maybe if it's going fast, maybe they could choose the letters before they run out of energy. Because if you have to wait for it to cycle through A to Z, say five times to spell hello, then the longer you have to wait, the more you're burning energy. So maybe I should actually speed it up. So anyway... I'm probably going to try that next with a faster speed to see if that helps. And then if there's more than one ghost or spirit competing to communicate with you, so if you have seven ghosts or spirits, then you might get seven different words, the first letter that a ghost or spirit's trying to say to you. Because every ghost or spirit wants a chance to talk to Keith Evans because he's given them an opportunity. And other people don't give the ghost of spirits an opportunity. So maybe I'm getting a bunch of constants because there's seven, maybe even more than that, ghost of spirits choosing that one first word. So you have to look at it. Uh, maybe the equipment is very good, but how do you convince ghost of spirits to just allow one spirit to choose words? And how do you get the others to cooperate? Can ghosts of spirits really realize that there's seven of them there and that they need to be the six that stand down and don't choose words? Yeah. So it's one of those things. Um, so I, I, at this point, I've only had the envoy for maybe a month to six weeks. And um, I haven't really used it that much. And like I say, I haven't used it. When I, you know, I've always used it as slow because as a person, I would miss it if it's going too fast. But maybe that's the wrong ideal. Maybe a spirit won't miss it and maybe I should turn it up all the way so that the movement going from A to Z is fast and maybe the results will be better. Yeah, you know, and with a new device like that, it could be a, a, a good argument, too, like you were saying before, to spend longer spans of time on these investigations or to keep coming back so that one, yes, the, the ghost or spirit is getting to know you and getting comfortable with you, but also the technology itself, if they don't know how to use it, you know, the first two, three times, you know, maybe they will by the 10th time too. So we'll see how the envoy uh, develops and evolves through the years. But um, I really enjoy learning about new paranormal investigation uh, equipment. Any of the new stuff comes out. I, I love the old stuff, of course, but I love these various forms of communication. Um, now, another form of communication, you mentioned this in the Hayes investigations, um, and you have talked about it before, that there are these knocking sounds in response to some of your questions. Uh, can you talk a bit about knocking, where it comes from, why is it being utilized, that kind of thing? Well, I think knocking is a spirit entering the room. For instance, like when I was doing paranormal session in uh, Sunshine's room, 
I brought a table in from out in the hallway so I could sit in the center of the room. And that way I would be away from all electrical appliances. So my millimeter would only pick up if it was, you know, a ghost or spirit. And I uh, had, had my chair with the back uh, to the two windows on the west side of uh, Sunshine's room, or the room that used to be Sunshine's when she was alive. In fact, she passed away in that room. So I was sitting there, and when I started my paranormal research, it sounded like someone had taken a plastic bag and slapped it against the window. And I turned around real quick. I turned around so quick I didn't even take my camera to show people. Uh, I think I finally did take the uh, camcorder and show that there was no one outside the window. So it is my belief and my theory that ghosts of spirits are small packets of electromagnetic energy. And when they travel at high speeds through the air, through the glass, and then back through the air, it's going to make a sound that sounds like a flap. Now, when they travel through wood, like if they were traveling through the air and travel through the exterior wood, the interior wood of the wall, and then out into the air, it's going to sound like a knock. Now, if a ghost or spirit is just like a human person, they're going to stand off to the side or stand close to the floor. And if they're close to the floor or close to the wall and their movement back and forth is not steady, they might move between the wall and the air, the wall and the air, and that makes the scratching sound, like you're, you know, scratching fingernails on a uh, a chalkboard, which most people find unnerving and eerie or think, oh, they're coming to get me. And, you know, it might sound like that because it's uncomfortable, but it's actually a ghost or spirit undulating between two mediums. And when I say medium, uh, in in chemistry and in science, a medium is like uh, gas, uh, which is, you know, like air, a solid, which would be like the wall, and then um, plasma would be one, but that's at super high temperatures. So anyway, when they're undulating between a solid and a liquid, they're going to make that type of scratching sound because that's electromagnetic energy kind of going between a solid and oh, a liquid. Liquid would be another medium. Anyway, when you're in a room or you're above ground, you're mainly going to have air and solids that a ghost of spirit could go through. And I think the knocking sound is them entering the room. And uh, usually you'll hear one knocking sound, and usually you'll say, I'll usually say out loud when I'm by myself, I hear you, I know you're here. So I know that some ghost spirit entered. And uh, I think when I was doing the paranormal research, that slap against the window that there was no apparent uh, reason for, the window was cracked, but I found out from the owner it was cracked a long time. It was cracked before they actually purchased the house and it had been cracked a long time. So that wasn't the reason for the slapping sound. But I've heard the slapping sound before in at other locations against uh, windows. And of course the window was never broken and there was never a bird that flew against it or someone throw a rock or anything like that. So uh, that is my theory about the knocking, the scratching, and the slapping sounds that you hear against the window. Well, um, so here, we're getting up here at the end. Um, there were just a couple other things I wanted to ask you about, some topics that I know that you have some knowledge about. Um, there are a few subjects that you told me before, and I'm, I'm really interested to hear about them. First off, uh, vampires. That's, that's not a topic I've looked very closely at as of yet. What are your thoughts on the concept of vampire? Well, I had thought about writing a book about vampires because it it seemed like the guardian angel theme of the Hayes house where you have ghosts that come back and protect and look after the the Hayes house, you know, the way the ghost of spirits did. So when I did the, you know, paranormal research there, it's like 80 to 90 percent original. So I figured someone was looking after the house. But when it comes to vampires, I thought it might be a topic 
that more people that are interested in paranormal would want to read about. And my whole uh, theory behind vampires are that some people were not actually dead and were buried alive, and somehow they had the ability to, like, go into a coma state where even though they were in a coffin, they, like, bears hibernate in the wintertime. Your body processes slow down to the point that you don't need the same amount of oxygen. You're alive. Your body doesn't deteriorate. And for some reason, you know how they place people in a coma to help their brain to heal? Mm-hmm. You know, things like that. Uh, they call them medical-induced comas. I think some people, if they have a certain illness or disease, have the ability to go into that type of coma. And I think today, in today's life, we would realize it and not bury them alive. But medicine has come a long ways just within the last 100 years. So probably before 1900, when they were so worried about burying people alive, there were probably medical situations where the doctor said, yeah, they're not breathing, there's no heartbeat. But I think some people go into a like an induced coma where their body needs time to heal. And grave robbing was a, you know, I guess was probably as common as, you know, certain jobs today are. Like, you know, people made their money by robbing graves. People actually would rob graves and sell the bodies to medical schools. So if someone dug up a grave and was robbing them and that person had not been embalmed like we do today, I think once a person is embalmed, that would just mess up the induced coma that some people go into. Now, if that person has went into an induced coma that they self-induce themselves into to heal, if the healing is done and someone opens up their grave, then, you know, they think, well, why is this person stealing my ring off my finger? And then that is where the legend or the tales about vampires came to be. But I think these people were actually buried alive because we did not have the technology to detect that they were in like a coma. And as soon as someone tried to rob their grave, that pretty much allowed them to come out of the coma. I think that is what vampires are. And, you know, today we, we embalm people to preserve them. So if a person had that ability to go into a self-induced coma, which we might even consider to be death, we might actually have destroyed their opportunity to come back because the embalming fluid, that probably would assure death, at least chemically, with my knowledge of chemistry, I, I would think that would ruin that. But if we're in a, if we ever go back or if someone is not embalmed and they're buried, there's a chance that we might, even with air modern equipment, might consider them to be dead. But their body might be in a hibernation state where they might be able to come back to life. Now, of course, if, if you're killed in an explosion or you're, you're killed by uh, nuclear radiation, then that's not going to happen. But under cer- certain circumstances, if you pass away, and your body is still intact, there might be a dormant period where you could lie where everyone thinks you're dead, but you might self-generate and self-heal and be able to come back. And um, I think that's my theory behind vampires. And I don't know like that would would interest people or not. Uh, It might be so technically... Uh, driven and so scientifically involved that most people may not want to read it. Well, I would find something like that interesting. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I enjoy theories. I enjoy the the digging and, and looking a little bit deeper, too. So, you know, I would be, uh, yeah, interested to read something like that. Um, well, one other subject I wanted to ask you about that I know you know or have some thoughts on, talk to me about doppelgangers 
uh, doppelganger. That's when uh, you see a ghost of a person who's still alive, like a duplicate. And um, when I was in the hospital, uh, I had a, a lot of problems at one time. I had uh, kidney failure. I had uh, internal bleeding from where I had taken ibuprofen in the area right above my esophagus. I had had uh, a, a blockage in my uh, one vein, which was causing uh, gangrene. And uh, so I was having a lot of problems all at one time. They wanted to go back in and do some type of surgical procedure uh, for the bleeding above my esophagus. And I knew I was scheduled. I found out the day before it was scheduled for about 1.30 p.m. So the next morning, I had, I had this one doctor. She was really, really nice doctor. I liked her a lot. She didn't come in the ICU room. The ICU rooms are, are small. But it was unusual that she stood out in the hall. But she was smiling. And I said, you must have good news. And she said, yes, your bleeding has stopped. And I said, wow, that's great. And at the time, I I was kind of out of it to the point that I wasn't sure what doctor took care of what. And uh, the, the do- doppelganger of the doctor that I saw was actually the, the kidney doctor. And it wasn't the doctor that was taking care of my internal bleeding. So I told the nurse, well, the doctor told me the internal bleeding had stopped. And I said, I'm, I'm not going to go down to the surgery. Why do they still want to go in and fool with it if it stopped bleeding? So I refused to go. And the nurse said, you know, this isn't good for you to get better if you continue to bleed like this. So they they were always drawing my blood. So they draw my blood sometime after, you know, one thirty, And... Uh, the nurse, same nurse came in. They were like 12-hour shifts. They started at 7 a.m. and worked until 7 p.m. So the same nurse came in about 5 p.m. and she said, uh, we got your results back from your blood tests and your red blood cells are increasing. So that showed that I had stopped bleeding. So then they, after that, they never mentioned me going back in to have anything done. But I asked that doctor, I had her for about two more years before she moved to another hospital and she moved out of the area. And I asked her, how did you know that my bleeding had stopped that morning? And she said there was no way for her to have known. And she said it wasn't her. So the bottom line was it was a doppelganger who appeared to me as someone that I would know and trust to give me that information. Because suppose they had went in there and fooled with it and caused it to bleed more. I could have bled out and bled to death. Because apparently it's a very delicate area. So it was just like the ghost or spirit was trying to help me to let me know the bleeding had stopped so they don't need to go back in. And, of course, I found out after the fact the bleeding had stopped. So I was glad that I paid attention to the doppelganger, which who I thought was just my doctor, who I knew and trusted. And um, that was a situation where a doppelganger was utilized. It was positive. All literature that I read, doppelgangers are usually like the omen of someone's going to die. Or, you know, if you see a doppelganger of someone, that person dies next. And uh, I think it makes for good literature if people want to read about that. But hopefully in the future, when I write about the positive things that happen to me involving paranormal more people will accept that and not only accept negative things that happen uh, concerning the paranormal. And I think all things are possible. But in my life, I'm very lucky that when paranormal takes place, it's positive. I'm just very lucky. I, I don't know why I'm so lucky, but you know, when it takes place around me, it's positive. Well, you're doing something right, so keep it up. Um, all right. Yeah. <laughs> well, Keith, where can folks find out more about you and uh, where can they pick up a copy of the Hayes House Ghosts Are People Too? Well, uh, if they want to see my paranormal short sessions, they can go to YouTube. My channel is called Paranormal Short Sessions by Keith Evans. And my book is only sold online. Uh, different people have said they found it online at Walmart, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, and uh, online at uh, 
Amazon. And that's in, inside the USA. If you're in Canada, Ireland, United Kingdom, you can find my book either on eBay or Amazon. Okay. And before we wrap today's show, any final thoughts or words of wisdom for us? Well, I just like people to try to stay as positive about the paranormal as possible. And uh, I would like to just do a shout out to anyone who would like me to do paranormal research at their home or building or Victorian house. Uh, I, I do tend to like to do the older homes because I think you have a uh, increased amount of ghost of spirits who are actually caring for that home like a guardian angel. Uh, I've asked them to please contact me. Uh, is it okay to uh, uh, give like my Instagram uh, information? Oh, absolutely. Please. It's uh, at PetCat2006. That's how you can contact me on uh, Instagram. And, uh, you know, I'd be more than willing to do paranormal research. Uh, I don't charge for a paranormal research, but I would definitely like to get it written permission for either a book, uh, TV program, and or a movie if I do uh, invest my time into doing paranormal research at your uh, location. And uh, I definitely share the paranormal information that I get uh, with the owner of the uh, location, whether it be a Victorian home or, uh, you know, just maybe a place where even <clears throat> I can get paranormal activity in the woods because probably at one point in time someone lived there in some capacity in the past. Yeah, for sure. Well, anybody listening, yeah, if you want to reach out to Mr. Evans here, maybe have him out to, you know, your location, you have a suggestion for a Victorian home or some other location that you'd like him to come out and do some research and investigate. He is very thorough. You will know what's going on there. And like he said, stay positive, folks. Well, thank you so, so much, Keith, for coming on today. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Keith Evans, for coming on the show. Keith is involved in quite a few more paranormal areas, which we just could not get to during our discussion. If you found this conversation interesting and would like to hear more from my guest, please join us backstage on the Patreon. We dive into another area of interest for him, time travel. Interesting stuff. Joining the Patreon is also an excellent way to support the show. $3 a month will get you a shout out plus a bonus episode every month. $5 will get you that plus a personal invite to the impending private Facebook page plus a seat in the PGP book club. Yes, book club. Y'all know I'm a reader. It was just a matter of time. That will be going up in October. And 10 whole dollars will get you all of that, plus your choice of some Paranorm Girl merch. And who doesn't love swag? Rate and review the show. It's so important, so important, you guys. Follow on the socials at Paranorm Girl Pod. That is all for today. See y'all back here next week. Stay safe, keep the nightlight on, and sleep with one eye open.